Hello everyone, Chris Potts here. Welcome to the first screencast in our series on quantifiers. Quantifiers were of course central to our previous unit on semantic composition, but they have a lot of intrinsic interest for compositional semantics, so we're going to do a deep dive on their properties. We're going to do this deep dive in the context of our previous semantic grammar, and we'll mainly be trying to get a grip on how different quantifiers contribute to the truth conditions of the sentences they appear in. Our companion reading is Keenan 1996, The Semantics of Determiners. Uh, Keenan here is the renowned linguist Ed Keenan. Uh, interestingly, Ed Keenan is another distinguished semanticist graduate of Swarthmore College, along with Barbara Partee and David Lewis. And I should add that Ed Keenan is not the same person as the E.O. Keenan who appears later in our syllabus. That's Eleanor Ox Keenan, the distinguished linguistic anthropologist. Anyway, back to Ed Keenan and determiners. For the assigned reading, my advice would be to watch some of the screencasts before you dive into the reading itself. It's a pretty unusual paper to read. Um, a lot of it is just lists of different kinds of quantifiers, and there are also a lot of definitions, and all of this is sort of loosely glued together with a little bit of prose for context, but actually not much context is provided. So the paper is surely most useful to people who already know what the material is all about and need a kind of reminder about the details. Now, I assure you that you'll be such people pretty soon, and then I do think the article will be valuable to you. When you do dive into the article, it'll be good for you to have a sense for what we're going to concentrate on as a class. So, we'll occasionally be making use of these categorizations that Keenan provides. These are linguistically interesting and help us to understand the range of quantifier meanings we see in languages. In terms of the concepts we'll focus on, we're going to study what Keenan calls increasing and decreasing, which is something we're going to refer to as the monotonicity of quantificational determiners and quantified phrases. Uh, and in this context, we'll find some linguistic patterns that might be governed by monotonicity, and we'll consider a language universal that Keenan proposes around this concept. We're also going to cover conservativity in some detail and think about proposed universals concerning that property as well. And finally, we'll look at the property that Keenan calls intersective, which is subtly different from the Parti notion of intersective that we explored for adjectives. And that's really all we'll have time for. And that means that a bunch of stuff from the article will be kind of left out. For example, we won't consider the property that Keenan calls extension, nor will we get to consider the definition of continuous. And we're going to save a critical discussion of the definite debts and NP section for when we talk about presuppositions. In addition, I think some of Keenan's definitions are hard to work through because he's trying for maximum generality. We'll be able to simplify them and make them more intuitive, and then you might find it rewarding to return to Keenan's definitions and see how they embed the same core concepts that we covered. Okay, let's dive into the handout. Section 1 is just a reminder. We're going to continue with the semantic grammar we built in the previous unit. Same universe and same denotations and denotation types for everything. We'll focus on the quantificational determiners that we defined in that grammar, and we're going to add to that batch of lexical items. And then the other pieces of the grammar will be relevant because we're giving compositional treatments to everything, of course, so everything is interacting with everything else. Section 2 builds a bridge into Keenan's paper, and the core insight is that Keenan's framework is fundamentally the same as ours, but he's just somewhat less explicit about the functions he's talking about and how they combine. For example, consider our meaning for every given in one. Uh, this gets the restriction argument for slot x and the scope argument for slot y, and then it tests whether x is a subset of y, returning true or false on that basis. Keenan's version is in two, and the idea here is that he's saying that every denotes the function that, for all possible inputs a and b, returns true if a is a subset of b. So, obviously, it's the same core meaning as ours, He's just been somewhat less explicit about how the variables get bound, and so the function itself is a bit more under the hood, as it were. Now, why didn't Keenan use lambdas and such? I'm actually not sure. I suspect it's because he wanted fewer symbols cluttering up an article that's already kind of comically full of symbols. Um, but I would argue that, despite some clutter, our view is superior. Uh, consider this quotation from the article. Keenan says, so we think of a debt 1 as combining with an n to make an np, the latter combining with p1s to make s's. So we'll circle back on all those abbreviations. To start, though, let's ask, what does combining mean in this quotation? 
It seems like Keenan has a theory of composition in mind, but he doesn't specify it precisely. We did, of course, though. We did that in the form of rules Q1 and Q2 from our grammar. Those rules exploit the functional meaning that we gave to determiners, just like Keenan did, and they fully spell out what combining should mean in these contexts, right? Our quantificational determiners are the D meanings, which Keenan calls debts. They combine with the restriction using rule Q1, right? The restriction for us is an NP, whereas Keenan says that they're just simple Ns for nouns, but that's hardly a, a, a central difference. And the nature of the combination for us and for Keenan is function application, and the output of it is a QP meaning, which is semantically a function that's still looking for its set argument. For us, that triggers rule Q2, which takes us from QP and VP nodes to S node meanings in a fully compositional fashion. So presumably, Parti would be happier with our treatment than with Keenan's, even if she feels some loyalty to her fellow Swarthmore alum. Final section for this introductory screencast, section three, some uncontroversial determiner meanings. I think these are uncontroversial, but you never know, so I put a question mark after uncontroversial. I'm open to exploration. Uh, but to start, so we've seen every in four, which is built from the subset relation. We've seen some, that's given in five, it's built from a test for a non-empty intersection between the restriction and the scope. And no is its contrary, it tests for an empty intersection between the restriction and the scope. And then we get into determiners that are built from cardinality tests. I think these meanings are pretty clear. The controversy here might be that we're not attending to all the details of semantic composition since we're treating these obviously phrasal elements as though they were lexical items. Uh, that should worry you as a compositional semanticist, but I think it's okay given our current goals, so we'll press on. So at least three as a lexical item. Uh, test whether the cardinality of the intersection has at least three entities in it. At most three is its converse. It tests whether the intersection has at most three entities in it. Uh, and if you wanted to, you could use those two together to define a meaning for exactly three, as in nine. That's what Keenan calls a Boolean combination of the two other meanings, since you sort of anded them together. I didn't bother with that, though. I just gave a direct meaning. In 10, I gave a pretty straightforward meaning for the obviously phrasal element more than half of the. That's certainly very clunky as a, quote, lexical item, but our focus is on the meaning. And I will say that this is the meaning I gave for most in our grammar, but I wouldn't expect that to be uncontroversial, as we'll see later in the unit, so I opted for this compositional Frankenstein's monster more than half of the. In 11, we have not every, which is a simple negation of every and four. There I'm confident we could work out the compositional story by generalizing the negation meaning from our grammar, but for now we'll just treat it as an atomic lexical item. And to round this out, I couldn't resist suggesting a fun one. This is up to 20 or more. Uh, it's sort of amusing to work that out. I think you'll find it somewhat vacuous, uh, and that could raise the question of why you occasionally see this phrasal lexical determiner uh, used out there in the world. Uh, okay, so I think that's a good point to begin wrapping up this intro. I will just say, if you're feeling shaky at all about this fast review that I've just done, I'd urge you to study screencast three in our previous series on semantic composition. That screencast is entirely about quantifi quantifier meanings, uh, and it's important to really have those meanings down pat before you dive into the special topics that we're gonna explore in this unit. Otherwise, I think this material will be needlessly technically challenging when the intent here is to get down to some interesting empirical questions.